Hello everyone, this is Sam of Historian Splaining. This will be the second installment in my series Doorways in Time on the Great Archaeological Discoveries, and this one will be on the so-called Nag Hammadi Library, which is a trove of early Christian documents coming originally from Roman Egypt and which constitutes most of our present-day knowledge of the Gnostic form of Christianity, a secretive, esoteric stream of Christian thought that arose very early in the history of Christianity. We don't know exactly when, but that flourished in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, and then was fairly quickly stamped out as the orthodox consensus that was hammered out at the ecumenical councils took hold. So let's talk about how this Nag Hammadi library was discovered, what has been found in it, and why it's so enormously significant to our understanding of the origins and development of Christianity. So the story of the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library begins one day in December 1945. And on this day, a man in the village of Nag Hammadi, Egypt, which is in Upper Egypt, the more rugged, rocky area of central and southern Egypt closer to Sudan, not far from the city of Luxor, this man named Muhammad Ali al-Siman, set out with his brother and possibly other neighbors and acquaintances into the desert outside of Nag Hammadi. And they went to a set of nearby cliffs looking for a type of soil called sabach, which is a very fertile soil that can be collected and used to fertilize gardens. And while searching around the base of a large boulder, Muhammad Ali found a large terracotta vase such as sometimes turns up in areas all around what used to be the Roman Empire. And he thought of possibly breaking open this vase to see its contents, but he held off for a time for fear that it might contain a jinn or malevolent spirit. Nonetheless, later that day, he went back to this vase and, surmising that it might contain valuable artifacts, particularly gold, he used one of his shepherding tools to strike and break open the vase. And he reported that he did, in fact, see a shower of gold as soon as the vase broke open. But it was not actual literal gold artifacts, but rather flakes of golden-colored papyrus. So looking through the wreckage of this large vase, which was about three feet long, he was able to pull out a stack of 13 codices, or hand-bound books with covers of antelope leather, as well as a number of loose pages which had writing on very light, thin papyrus. So he collected together these 13 codices and various loose leaves and sheets of papyrus, and he carried the whole stash back with him to his home in Nag Hammadi. And he put them down in the courtyard, not far from the oven, where his family cooked and brewed tea. They apparently sat there for several days, and reportedly some pieces of papyrus from the collection were used by Muhammad Ali's mother to fuel the cooking fire. Meanwhile, Muhammad and his brother, who was also nearby at the time when he found this vase with the stash of books, They were involved in an ongoing blood feud, and they had sworn revenge against a man whom they believed had killed their father. And reportedly, they had their shepherding and gardening tools sharpened to be prepared in case this man should come near Nag Hammadi unprotected. And after not long, an opportunity did arise where this man was in the vicinity. So Muhammad Ali and his brother tracked him down, killed him, and allegedly cut out his heart and ate part of it to show that they had completed and fulfilled their oath and ended this blood feud. Now, not surprisingly, just a matter of days after this killing, Egyptian police showed up 
and arrested Muhammad and his brother and searched through their home. But by the time that this happened, the stack of manuscripts was already gone. Now, we don't know exactly how this had happened. There are conflicting accounts. But at some point before Muhammad and his brother killed the man that they suspected of killing their father, someone had passed off this stack of books and manuscripts for safekeeping to a local Christian priest who then kept them in his home. And this priest happened to have a friend who was a local school teacher. And this school teacher, when visiting the priest's home, was able to recognize the great age and potential value of these old manuscripts. And this teacher then made contact with friends and acquaintances in Cairo to see if people might be interested in seeing and obtaining these manuscripts. What happened next after this is again unclear, but at some point not long after this, within a few weeks, somebody, we don't know whom for certain, started selling these books into the quasi-legal market around Cairo where there were a great many dealers and collectors of antiquities, particularly from Europe, who were interested in finding new artifacts and possibly new ancient texts as they turned up in Egypt. So early in 1946, one dealer obtained one codex from this Nag Hammadi collection, which we now customarily call Codex One. And this dealer was able to buy the codex on this largely secretive underground market in Cairo and then sneak it out of the country, basically get it past customs and border guards by simply dismissively saying, oh, it's just an old book, and brought it back to Europe. Once it then appeared on the antiquities market in Europe, a Dutch scholar named Gilles Quispel was able to recognize the great importance of the book. He was able to interpret that it was a book of mystical philosophy and theology, and he then persuaded the Carl Jung Institute in Austria to buy it. And ever since, it has belonged to the Jung Institute, and so Codex Number 1 is sometimes also called the Jung Codex. Over time, over the next several months, several other books in a clearly similar style and material also began to appear on the Cairo market and circulate among dealers and collectors. So naturally word got out and reached many scholars and curators of ancient literature in Egypt. And one of them in particular, Togo Mina, the director of the Coptic Museum in Cairo, used public money to buy two of them and put them into the collection of the museum. The following year, in 1947, a French scholar of early Christianity named Jean Dorès traveled to Egypt. And Dorès went to Egypt for the purpose of exploring and examining old ruined monasteries around the area of Luxor in Upper Egypt, so the same basic part of the country as Nag Hammadi. But before he could travel to Upper Egypt, he was detained because of a cholera epidemic, which restricted travel in Egypt. So he went instead for a time to the Coptic Museum and looked at their collections. And while he was there, the director, Togomina, showed him these two codices that he had obtained from the antiquities market and asked him if he could make sense or interpret their contents. And he was able to see that one of these codices contained in it two texts with the titles Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit and Secret Book or Apocryphon of John. So right away, Dorès recognized that these texts were Gnostic, and hence they were highly important and could contain very valuable and rare information on this mysterious movement. So after recognizing the importance of these codices, then Dorès traveled to the Luxor area, visited the ancient monasteries, and was able to hear and gather rumors of a massive find with many more codices that had come up near the village of Nag Hammadi. He was able to piece together a good deal of information and confirm with some confidence that a large stash had been found in that area, but he was not able to locate or meet Muhammad Ali himself. 
Rather, he reported back to Togomina at the Coptic Museum and urged him to obtain all of the other codices from this find. And so Mina and his successor at the museum, Pahor Labib, ensured that the Egyptian government over the next several years bought or confiscated all 12 of the codices before they were able to be taken out of Egypt. They wanted to ensure that they were not lost to the international market but stayed in Egypt. And working with the Coptic Museum, three European and American scholars, namely Jean Dorès, who I mentioned, Gilles Quispel from the Netherlands, and James Robinson from the United States, organized an international committee to study, translate, and publish the entire collection. But this project was delayed for many years, really for decades, due to heavy legal wrangling over the ownership and proper disposition of these codices. The Egyptian government had had to move quickly to stop them from vanishing onto the legal or illegal black market. And many dealers and previous owners fought this in court. And there was a great deal of wrangling even over the ability to see these codices, let alone translate them and publish them. But finally, after these issues were resolved in the 1970s, they began to be published, sometimes with some exegesis and commentary to put them in the context of Christian history and theology. James Robinson from the United States also was able to go to Nag Hammadi and meet and interview Muhammad Ali al-Siman. And in this interview, he was able to gain some more details about the exact location and condition of the books when they were found. But some of these details were inconsistent. Different people had different differing stories. And even Muhammad Ali al-Siman himself sometimes was inconsistent in his different tellings, which is not unusual for someone recalling events from many years ago. But these details would come into play in determining why these books precisely were produced and why they were stashed away in this jar, which is still quite mysterious. Finally, in 1979, the first extensive analysis and the first new study on early Christianity taking into account these discoveries from Nag Hammadi was published, and that was by the relatively young American scholar Elaine Pagels in her book, The Gnostic Gospels. So what was in these books, and why did they matter so much? Well, as a basic overview, there was a total of 13 codices, as I said, hand-bound books, each of which contained one or more collected texts. So there were separate headings and titles for different documents. So all in all, there was a total of 52 discrete texts of various sorts, but there were only 44 distinct texts because some of them were repeated several times. And a few of these 44 texts had been previously known from other sources, from the very small scattered discoveries that had been made before of Gnostic texts. But the bulk of them were totally new and unique to Nag Hammadi and have still never been found in any other time or place. All of these different texts were written in Coptic and written in a special Greco-Coptic writing system that basically uses the Greek alphabet with some small adjustments and additions to make it more efficient for writing an Afro-Asiatic language like Coptic. And it is generally agreed that all of these texts were originally composed in Greek and then translated into Coptic. So what are these texts and what do they say? Well, there are several different sorts of texts collected together in the library. For one thing, there are short prayers, like the prayer of the Apostle Paul and the prayer of thanksgiving, which is a mystical hermetic prayer. There are several apocryphons, which is a word for secret books or collections of secret teachings only for initiates. And these include the Apocryphon of James and the Apocryphon of John. There are also Gospels, which in the more strict and narrow sense means 
accounts of the life and actions and teachings of Jesus Christ. So some of these Gospels, in the stricter sense, include the Gospel of Thomas, which is a collection of reported sayings of Jesus Christ, the Gospel of Philip, the book of Thomas the Contender, the Dialogue of the Savior, and the letter of Peter to Philip. There are also what I would call treatises, or books of doctrine and commentary on the scriptures that don't necessarily talk about Christ himself directly, or do not contain accounts of Christ's life or sayings. So these include the Gospel of Truth, the Treatise on the Resurrection, the Tripartite Tractate, the Hypostasis of the Archons, On the Origin of the World, the Exegesis on the Soul, the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit, the Epistle of Eunostos the Blessed, Sophia of Jesus Christ, the Acts of Peter and the Twelve, the Authoritative Teaching, the Second Treatise of the Great Seth, the Gnostic Apocalypse of Peter, the Paraphrase of Shem, the Teachings of Silvanus, Zastrianos, Marsanis, Elogenes, Melchizedek, the Testimony of Truth, the Interpretation of Knowledge, the Valentinian Exposition, Hypsiphrony, and the Trimorphic Protenoia, which is a Greek title that means the first thought which has three forms. There are also apocalypses, or books of prophecies and revelations. And these include the Apocalypse of Paul, the first Apocalypse of James, the second Apocalypse of James, the Apocalypse of Adam, and the concept of our great power. So from these you should see that there are many treatises, gospels, secret books that are written in the voice of some biblical figure, like Peter or James or John, or even in one case Adam from the book of Genesis. But it's highly unlikely that any of them really were penned by the people that they're attributed to. They're just using them as sort of personas and voices. There are two Greek philosophical texts which come from classical Greek sources that are not specifically Christian. And these are Plato's Republic, there's a version of Plato's Republic, and the Sentences of Sextus, which is a collection of aphorisms or utterances from the school of Pythagoras. There are two hermetic treatises. So these are philosophical treatises coming from the sort of mystical, philosophical mystery cults in Egypt. And these are the Discourse of the Eighth and Ninth and Asclepius. And lastly, there are several poems, including the Three Steles of Seth, The Thought of Norea, and Thunder Perfect Mind. So what do all of these books say, and how do they fit into what we know of Christian history? Well, it was clear right away from as soon as Jean Dorès saw those two codices in the Coptic Museum back in 1947. It's clear that these books were produced by the Gnostics, which is a branch or stream or school of thought within early Christianity that for centuries has been very mysterious. True knowledge, understanding, especially internal knowledge of what the Gnostics believed and what they did has been very scarce. And especially before 1945, information that scholars had about Gnosticism was very narrow and problematic and biased. So one major source of information about Gnosticism was simply attacks that so-called orthodox, what we would today call orthodox, mainstream theologians, made upon the Gnostics, condemning them as heretics. And the most extensive of these was a long tract written by the important early theologian and church father Irenaeus, which he wrote around the year 180. There then are also shorter, mostly condemning references or descriptions of the Gnostics by Tertullian, Origen, and Epiphanius. And these references to the Gnostics by these more mainstream or proto-Orthodox theologians have certain common themes. There are certain recurring allegations or accusations that they make about the Gnostics. 
So they tend to say that the Gnostics used seduction, especially sexual seduction and feminine wiles, to lure in new followers into their secretive Gnostic group. They claim that the Gnostics rejected marriage and family life, and that they engaged in orgies and sexual depravity. Now, it is possible that something like that, some sort of freer sexual practice, might have gone on among the Gnostics if it fit into their theology and their alleged rejection of normal family and marriage norms. And there's one pretty extensive passage written by the Bishop Epiphanius in the 300s, so fairly late in the life of Gnosticism, where Epiphanius says that the Gnostics believed that the world was ruled by a set of evil earthly powers that they called Archons, or the Archon, but also that they had a practice of gathering things from the world in order to offer them to this Archon. And there's one passage, possibly the most sensational reference to the Gnostics from mainstream Christian literature, where Epiphanius describes them and says, quote, They say that the flesh must perish and cannot be raised, but belongs to the archon. But the power in the menses and semen, they say, is soul, which we gather and eat. And whatever we eat, meat, vegetables, bread, or anything else, we do these creatures a favor by gathering the soul from them all and taking it to the heavens with us. Hence they eat meat of all kinds. Those of them who are called Phibionites offer their vile sacrifices of fornication. They thus make fools of their female partners and say, Lie with me that I may offer you to the Archon. End quote. So here, although Epiphanius himself at other points describes being tempted and seduced by attractive female Gnostics. Here he also turns the situation around and says male Gnostics try to lure women into bed by saying, uh, I, by having sex with you, I'm offering you to the Archon. So this is a very strange, outlandish sort of theology as described here by Epiphanius, and it's very difficult to discern, especially before the discovery of the Nan Kamadi Library. It's hard to tell how much this might be rooted in fact or close to fact, or if it's just kind of fanciful allegations and smearing of the Gnostic movement. But it is significant that he claims that acts of eating and sex are seen by the Gnostics as offerings to this being called the Archon. And this might accord with other references to the Gnostics, especially in Irenaeus, whom, as I said, wrote the only really extensive exploration of their theology. But again, it's really unreliable because he was only writing his tract in order to refute them and reject them as heretical. Meanwhile, there was no direct knowledge of what the Gnostics themselves actually said. There was no surviving writing or document of any kind from an actual Gnostic writer known in the world until the late 1700s, so more than a thousand years after the Gnostic movement had long died out. In the late 1700s, a few small fragments of Gnostic tracts in the Coptic language were found in Egypt, mainly by European antiquarians at a time when Britain and France were very powerful and interfering in Egyptian political affairs, and when there were many European scholars increasingly interested in the history of Christianity and in finding early Christian documents. So in a few occasions, beginning first in 1769, Europeans did find pieces of Gnostic tracts and take them back to Europe. And it was very slow for Europeans then to copy and translate and eventually publish these pieces of Gnostic literature, especially because knowledge of the Coptic language was very scarce in Europe. The first ever substantial book of Gnostic writings ever to be found was the so-called Berlin Codex, which is a collection with four texts in it, including among them a so-called Gospel of Mary, claiming that Jesus Christ had given secret special teachings to Mary Magdalene, 
And this Berlin Codex was found in Cairo by a German diplomat in 1896. He then brought it with him back to Berlin, where for many years it was very closely guarded, and it took years to translate and publish the contents of the Berlin Codex. And this was, in fact, still being worked on very slowly year by year in the 1940s at the time when the Nag Hammadi Library came to light. Nonetheless, from these different sources, from Irenaeus and Epiphanius, and from these fragments and from the Berlin Codex, scholars were able to discern some of the basic core teachings of the Gnostics, even before the Nag Hammadi Library was found. And these include, for one thing, dualism. So dualism broadly just means the belief that the universe is divided into two basic substances and contended over by two opposing forces. And in the case of the Gnostics, it seems that they believed in contending principles of good and evil and of light and darkness. So they don't simply believe in one single sovereign God. It's not a simple, straightforward monotheism. Rather, they see God as having an adversary, a God of light contending with a power of darkness. And furthermore, they divide the universe along lines of spiritual versus material. So rather than saying that there are good and bad spiritual entities and there are good and bad bodies or good and bad matter, instead they believe that the material world is evil and imprisoning, that it is a force of darkness, whereas the spirit is good. The spirit is entrapped in the material world and it must be freed, and particularly the spirit must be freed from the body. They believed that the material world was created by a lesser or malevolent god, sometimes also called a demiurge or craftsman. And this basic idea may sound familiar if you know about Manichaeism or Catharism, which are later movements. Manichaeism coming a few hundred years later out of Persia, and then the Cathar movement arising in France in the Middle Ages. These movements were also dualist. And they also taught that a demiurge had created the physical world. The Gnostics also taught that the way to free the soul from the body was by gaining special spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge only accessible to a select few. And this knowledge was called gnosis. And that's a Greek word that one can translate as knowledge, but it's really more specific than that. It means knowledge from direct experience. So you could say it also means sort of enlightenment or acquaintance, ineffable knowledge that can only be encountered internally rather than stated in words. And probably at least some of the Gnostics, it seemed, were docetist, which is a way of interpreting Christianity that I mentioned in my lectures on the early church. So docetism comes from the Greek word for appearance. It's the belief that Christ was not really a flesh and blood human being. He only appeared to be. He was, in fact, purely spiritual, some sort of God or angel or spirit who took on the appearance of a human being. And to go back to Epiphanius, according to Epiphanius, the Gnostics taught that, quote, he has not taken flesh, he is merely an apparition. So that is a pretty classic statement of the docetist belief. Furthermore, it seems the Gnostic, Gnostics believed that they could become Christ-like or divine themselves. They could take on the spiritual stature and properties of Jesus Christ. And they practiced some sort of chrism, meaning anointing, to mark their becoming Christ's. Right? Christ means the anointed. Chrism is the act of anointing. And also, possibly, they may have believed, there were suggestions that they may have believed in reincarnation for those who were not enlightened. So if you did not achieve this gnosis and spiritual enlightenment, then you were trapped in the material world and would continue to be reborn in bodies. And finally, it seems that alongside their devotion to Christ, the Gnostics also had reverence for a female figure of divine wisdom called Sophia.
which again is just the Greek term for wisdom. So this is a little sketch of the apparent basic beliefs of the Gnostics that one could discern even before 1945 and the discovery of Nag Hammadi. Now, who were these Gnostics? Well, as I said, they were a movement of early Christians who organized themselves into subgroups. You can think of them like little cells within existing churches. So they did not separate out. They were not a separate church unto themselves. They were not a branch of the church. Rather, they organized in private cells, held their own private meetings, but they did not withdraw from or split from the mainstream church. And in these private meetings and gatherings, they taught an esoteric or secret message about the hidden meanings of the Christian gospel. So they didn't deny the truth or legitimacy of the sermons or the scriptures that were read out in ordinary churches. Rather, they taught that there was a hidden message within that Christian gospel that only they could fully grasp. So these subgroups, these subcells of Gnostics, it appears that geographically they first arose in Syria and Palestine. So very close to the early beginning centers of Christianity, like Jerusalem, Galilee, Damascus, and so on. The first big city in which a Gnostic group, it seems, took hold was Antioch, also a pretty early center of Christianity on the eastern Mediterranean. From there, it seems it spread southward into Egypt and took off and became fairly popular in the Christian church in Egypt. It also then gradually spread eastward beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire and then westward and made its way into Rome in the center of the empire. And it seems that this infiltration of the Gnostic movement into Rome is what attracted the attention of major church leaders and led important church fathers like Irenaeus to take notice of them and begin writing and preaching against them. As I said previously, all of these important Gnostic documents that have been discovered, those early fragments found in the 1700s, the Berlin Codex, the Nag Hammadi Library, all of them have come to light in Egypt, and all of them are in the Coptic language. And so it can seem from that as if Egypt must have been the major center of Gnosticism. But in fact, that doesn't seem to be true. It doesn't seem as if Egypt was a greater center of the Gnostic movement than, say, Palestine and Syria. But rather, it's an effect of the climate. It's the fact that Egypt has such a totally dry climate that very ancient documents, including documents on papyrus, can last for thousands of years, almost completely undamaged. So that's why our surviving knowledge of Gnosticism overwhelmingly comes from these finds in Egypt. So the Gnostic movement, it was not just in Egypt, it was in other areas of the Eastern Mediterranean. It also found a foothold in Rome. And who were these Gnostics? Well, it seems that they were mainly lay people, especially sort of middle-class, literate people, both men and women, and there are reasons to think that it was especially predominantly women. But it was, it seems, a movement of literate lay people, not so much of clergy. There's very little evidence of priests or bishops or even monks or nuns being Gnostics. And furthermore, the surviving evidence suggests that there were three main schools of Gnostics, each of which had a slightly different character and center of gravity. The earliest one, probably the earliest and also the most mysterious of the three, is the Sethians. So this was a movement apparently mainly Jewish that arose very early in Palestine and Judea, which had a mix of Hellenistic Jewish and Egyptian teachings and practices. It was, it seems, was eclectic. It had a largely Jewish base, but then also integrated in Jesus Christ into their theology and mythology. So the Sethians identified Seth, the son of Adam, in the book of Genesis with the Egyptian god Set, 
who is a sort of trickster god, a god of death, who usually is cast as a villain in Egyptian texts. But the Sethians identified the biblical Seth with this Egyptian god Set and saw both of them as good, as redeeming figures, who specifically offered escape or liberation from the prison of earthly material life. It seems very likely that this Sethian group and Sethian movement had already taken shape among Jews even before Christianity appeared. But once Christianity arose, the Sethians integrated Christ into their mythology as a reincarnation of Seth. So they see Jesus as a sort of new coming of Seth, and they believe that Seth and Jesus Christ gave secret teachings to their followers that offered them a path to escape from the body and material existence. So it's possible that this is where the rudiments of Gnosticism first came together among these Sethians, mainly in Judea. Not long after that, another school arose called Basilidian, which was started by a teacher named Basilides in Alexandria in Egypt. And it may have also traveled from there over into Persia. So that may be how Gnosticism made its way across the border from the Roman Empire to the Persian. And it apparently, the Basilidian group apparently persisted in Egypt at least into the late 300s. And this is probably the group that's described in Epiphanius's writings. And more specifically, one offshoot group of the Basilidians, led by a teacher named Carpocrates, apparently were the first to actually use the term Gnosticos for themselves. So a to mean a Christian who has this special knowledge, who has gnosis. So that's why this, this term Gnostic has stuck to them. But the Basilidians also were very eclectic. They integrated in a lot of Greek teachings and apparently referred to writings associated with Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle, as well as Christian writings. The third group is Valentinian, which was started by the theologian Valentinus in Rome. This group is the most documented. We know the most about them because Irenaeus and others like him came into contact with the Valentinians in Rome and wrote and talked about them. And the Valentinians, it seems, taught a three-tiered scheme of the world. So they believed there were three kinds of people, three categories of people, material, psychical, and spiritual. And material people, that was basically pagans and non-Christians. And the material people, they believed, were doomed to die. Their souls would simply perish with their bodies, and they would cease to exist. Psychical people is how they referred to ordinary Christians, people who had been baptized, who were believing Christians, but did not have gnosis. And these people get a partial salvation. They enjoy some kind of life beyond death. Finally, the spiritual people is themselves, right? The Gnostics. And they believed that the spiritual people did get true eternal life by reuniting their souls with the universe. And they saw the universe as a sort of spiritual realm also sometimes called the pleroma, or fullness, completeness. And they believed that through Gnosis, they reunited their souls into the pleroma and hence became immortal. So these are the basic outlines of what was known about the Gnostics based on the surviving evidence. A major question, of course, that a lot of people debated through the years is where did these Gnostics get their beliefs? And the major dividing line is whether Gnosticism was primarily intra-Christian, if it was simply a sort of reworking, reassemblage of ideas from within the Christian fold, maybe rooted in the teachings of Christ himself, or did it arise from outside influence, from other religions, from the pagan world? And there are a number of possible inspirations and sources one can point to for Gnosticism, both within and without the Christian fold. So for one thing, there is Marcion of Sinope and the Marcionites, which I've also mentioned in my lectures on the early church. So Marcion was an early preacher and theologian, the creator of the first 
collection of Christian writings, which was called the New Testament. So Marcion's New Testament preceded the canonical one that we know today. And Marcion rejected the Old Testament God. He viewed the Hebrew God, the God of the Hebrew Bible, as a kind of malevolent or at best morally ambiguous power who was separate from the God of Jesus Christ and the New Testament. So in his view, these were two different gods, and Jesus Christ should be seen as a messenger and a representative of the good God, the spiritual God, who frees humankind from the power of the evil Old Testament God. So you can see where this naturally might have been one of the bases and inspirations for Gnosticism. There's also Greek sources, especially Plato and Platonism. So if you look at Plato, you again see a kind of dualism where Plato teaches that there is an ideal world, a world of forms that is eternal, unchanging, and that is more real than the material world of actual physical objects. And clearly, in some way, this was taken as an inspiration and a source for many Gnostics. And I mentioned before Carpocrates, who was a Basilidean Gnostic, and reportedly he set up places of worship where these Gnostics in his group met, and they put up icons representing Jesus, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. So there's clearly a strong Greek element in Gnosticism, and some scholars have argued that Gnosticism is basically just a, a Greek-style rereading and reinterpretation of Christianity, or Platonism gone wild, as some have said. But today, most scholars would say that's a pretty weak explanation, that in fact, Gnosticism is more distinct unto itself, and it is not simply a Platonic version of Christianity. There also are the Jewish sources, the Jewish wisdom tradition. You see a lot of resonances between Gnostic texts and Jewish wisdom literature like the Book of Proverbs, and of course, Sethianism, which may be the original seedbed of Gnosticism. So it's possible you could say that Gnosticism is not really essentially Christian because it may have pre-existed in this Sethian form even before being Christianized. There also is possible Persian influence, such as especially Zoroastrianism, the traditional faith of the Persian Empire, which also is dualist, which sees the world as divided between good and evil principles, dark and light. And many have also theorized that maybe some Hindu or Buddhist influence in Gnosticism. You know, a lot of the things I've been describing probably sound remarkably familiar. Uh, the idea of being stuck in reincarnation until one attains enlightenment, uh, the prison of physical existence, and so on. So many lay people have said this seems remarkably similar to Hinduism and Buddhism, and that may or may not be the case. There are some things to say in support of this idea. For instance, the early Christian theologian Hippolytus who was a Greek Christian living and writing in Rome in the early 200s. He wrote a tract discussing the different sources of heresy that were bringing heretical teachings into Christianity. And among these sources, he specifically lists the Brahmins of India as one inspiration for heresy. So Hippolytus in his tract writes, quote, there is among the Indians a heresy of those who philosophize among the Brahmins, who live a self-sufficient life, abstaining from eating living creatures and all cooked food. They say that God is light, not like the light one sees, nor like the sun nor fire, but to them God is discourse, not that which finds expression in articulate sounds, but that of knowledge, and he uses the Greek word gnosis, through which the secret mysteries of nature are perceived by the wise. End quote. So you can see here, Hippolytus specifically points out that there is this resonance between so called heretics, between Christians that he views as heretics, and certain mystical ascetic Brahmins in India. And it certainly seems very suspicious that that might be a source. A, an inspiration for Gnosticism, but it's also significant that he specifically says that these Brahmins are vegetarian, that they avoid 
eating meat, which goes directly counter to what Epiphanius said about the Gnostics that he knew, who eat all kinds of meat, in fact, eat everything they can get their hands on, and they see this as a kind of offering. So there's some contradiction and ambiguity here, but it certainly is reasonable to suspect there might be some connection between Hindu and Buddhist teachings and Gnosticism. Another reason to suspect this also is when one looks at the surviving Gnostic writings, and we'll see this when we go through contents of the Nag Hammadi Library, there's a great emphasis on Thomas. So the Apostle Thomas and Mary Magdalene are the two main figures that the Gnostics look to as their teachers, their forebears, as the bearers of this special esoteric tradition from Jesus Christ. And you may know that according to oral tradition in India, the Apostle Thomas himself actually went to India, brought the Christian gospel there, and founded a church in southern India. And this church still exists, and they traditionally call themselves Thomas Christians due to their belief that they are connected to St. Thomas himself. And it's certainly possible that the early existence of this Indian church may have led some ideas and practices from India to flow back westward into the Christian world. It may have been a sort of portal of exchange and mutual influence. And as these ideas made their way into Christianity in the Roman Empire, they may have continued to be associated with St. Thomas, regardless of whether the oral tradition is accurate. It's certainly possible that Thomas himself did go all the way to India, but even if not, as Christians in the Near East and the Mediterranean learned of these ideas and these teachings, they may have continued to connect them to the figure of Thomas. Now, that being said, there is no proof, and we cannot necessarily know that there really was a connection to India and to Hindu or Buddhist teachings. Rather, if one looks at the general picture, it seems, of the late Roman world, it was really a continuation of the Hellenistic world, a world of exchange, of movement, of travel, all the way from Central Asia and India through the Near East into the Mediterranean and Europe. And, of course, the main medium of this exchange of ideas, teachings, practices was the Greek language. And so it's a world in which different ideas could have had, had mutual influence or could have shared influences or backgrounds. And we can't necessarily know just because two ideas seem to be quite similar in two different places in this world in the 2nd or 3rd century AD. That doesn't mean that there was a direct link. So if all of these might be possible sources or inspirations for Gnostic teachings, nonetheless, why did this movement arise in the place and time that it did? Some have argued that the rise of Gnosticism in the Eastern Roman Empire might have been an expression of dissatisfaction and disillusionment. The Gnostics constantly emphasize that the material world is illusory, that it is imprisoning, that it is ruled by malevolent forces and spirits. And it may be that as sort of literate middle class people in the Eastern Roman Empire saw the empire becoming sclerotic, unresponsive, institutions going into decline, you know, this is similar to the argument some historians have made as to why Christianity arose in the first place, that it was a way of distancing oneself from earthly, ordinary life in this declining empire in the midst of uh, disaffection with the older pagan cults and a feeling of powerlessness that all of this may have then channeled into the embrace of this Gnostic teaching that one can escape from the ordinary material world through spiritual knowledge. So if this is a plausible explanation of the rise of Gnosticism in the Eastern Roman world, what happened to it? Why did it disappear? Well, it seems that it was gradually suppressed by uh, threats of excommunication, their ideas were aggressively rejected, and they were specifically ruled out at the ecumenical councils, the four large gatherings of bishops that took place over the course of the 300s and 400s that worked out shared 
mainstream consensus Christian doctrine, and it's not surprising that the ecumenical councils excluded Gnostic ideas because no Gnostics were represented. They were not an organized branch of the church that could send bishops to these councils, so they had no voice or representation there. And over the course of the 200s and 300s and 400s, their scriptures were rejected. A Christian canon was formed, what we now think of as the New Testament, which excluded all Gnostic teachings and writings. And finally, what was left of Gnosticism was forcibly suppressed as a heresy after the Roman Emperor Theodosius made Nicene Christianity the state religion in 380. So at that point, there's now the force of law and the state backing up what was by then considered Orthodox Christianity and suppressing Gnosticism. And the movement went into a rapid decline, it seems, and was basically gone by about the year 500. Now, nonetheless, there arguably was some survival of Gnosticism in some ways. There was the influence of Gnosticism, it seems, on the Manichaean religion, a new religion that arose in Persia and Central Asia, and that also at different times made its way into Europe. And as for the modern era down to today, uh, there is one group known as the Mandeans, which is a small, closed religious group that lived for centuries in southern Iraq in the isolated marshes and wetland areas around the lower Tigris and Euphrates valleys in Iraq that claims descent from John the Baptist and may actually be historically connected to the spiritual cleansing and revival movement of John the Baptist. They still exist now. They have mostly emigrated from Iraq. Many of them have gone to the United States. And the Mandeans practice immersion baptism in lakes and rivers, much like the John the Baptist movement in the Jordan River. But they seem to interpret baptism spiritually in a way that is very similar to Gnostics, and they see it as part of a liberation of the soul from the body. So there arguably is a kind of, broadly speaking, a Gnosticism to Mandeanism, and maybe they were directly influenced by these Gnostic movements in antiquity. So if that is our broad understanding of Gnosticism, what about the Nag Hammadi Library? Why was it produced? Why were these books written, bound, and collected together in this stash? Well, as I mentioned, the area around Luxor in Upper Egypt was a major center of early monasticism. And in fact, the Christian monastic movement really began in Egypt in the first place, and this specific area was a sort of center of monasticism. The village of Nag Hammadi is roughly in the middle of three sites of major early Christian monasteries. And remember, that is why Jean Dorès was going to that area to begin with. So it has been argued that maybe the library was created by and for monks who were collecting these texts and these Gnostic teachings because they understood them as spiritual and meditative texts that helped them to connect to the divine. However, there is no other evidence of Gnostic monks. Hence, it could also be argued that they were created by scribes who were patronized by wealthy literate gentry, the sort of people who could host Gnostic meetings in their homes. So either way, either of these seems possible at this point. If that is how the texts were produced, why were they buried in a jar in the remote desert? Well, we don't know why. There's no document explaining why, but it seems possible that it relates to a decree issued by Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, who was a very powerful, respected early church leader, a decree that he issued in the year 367. And this decree was the first to explicitly list out the 27 canonical books of the New Testament that we know today. So he was trying to define and enforce a specific Christian canon 
and he condemned all other books outside that canon of 27. And he said that those other books, although they may not be heretical necessarily, they may lead one astray. And so he ordered for all other books outside of those 27 to be destroyed. And we know that this decree was very important and in some way at least was enforced in these monasteries in Upper Egypt because the decree, the text of it was painted onto the walls of one of those monasteries. So this may lend credence to the idea that other books and texts were circulating and being read in those monasteries and then were suppressed because of Athanasius's decree. So hence, it has been theorized maybe the books that we see in the Nag Hammadi library were buried in order to hide them and preserve them until a later time when they might be allowed again. The other argument that some have made is that the library may simply be a funerary deposit, or in other words, grave goods, that they may have been buried as sort of valued possessions of some wealthy person in that area of Egypt. And in fact, in the 1970s, when James Robinson spoke directly with Muhammad Ali al-Siman, Muhammad said that he also found remains of a body and some charcoal in the ground near the jar. And if that is true, that suggests that it was a burial site, that, and hence that there, this was a funeral deposit. However, this claim that the jar was next to a body or a skeleton and some charcoal was denied by Muhammad's brother. So they remember the scene differently. And again, it's possible that he may have been misremembering or he may have been adding and embellishing with new details. So finally, what do the actual texts in the Nag Hammadi library say and what is significant about them for our understanding of Christianity. Well, the first scholarly analysis of the contents of the library was, as I mentioned, published in 1979 by Elaine Pagels. And in her book, The Gnostic Gospels, she argues that the texts reveal certain long-running disputes and divisions within the church between the Gnostic understanding of Christianity and the proto-Orthodox understanding. And in particular, she focuses on the clearly central and crucial disagreement over the nature of Christ and the resurrection. So I'll talk about what the Nag Hammadi texts say about that and several other points that they reveal in addition. So firstly, there is this dispute over how to understand Jesus Christ's resurrection. Many texts in the Nag Hammadi library explicitly dispute the nature of Christ's resurrection and argue that it was a spiritual, not bodily, resurrection. And this naturally makes sense if, as we think Gnostics do, if you believe that the spirit is good and the body is evil, then you wouldn't want to say that Christ actually resurrected in his body. The whole point of the faith from the Gnostic point of view is to free oneself from the body. So this notion that the resurrection is a purely spiritual event, not physical, this is a continuing central theme all through the Nag Hammadi texts, among many different books that in other ways have totally different views. So this position that the resurrection is spiritual is adhered to whether the writer of the text sees Christ as human, as purely divine, or as some combination of both. So there are some books in the library that are docetist, as I said before. They see Christ as a spiritual entity that only appeared in human form. There are others that are not docetist, and that affirm that Jesus Christ did have a human body and nature. But nonetheless, they all agree that the resurrection was only spiritual. So some non-Docetist books in the library, they include the Treatise on the Resurrection in Codex 1, which affirms that Christ had a human nature, but completely rules out the possibility of a bodily resurrection, as well as the Gospel of Truth, which seems to be important. It appears twice in 
Codex 1 and 12. Also, Mechizedek in Codex 9, which is written in the voice and persona of a temple priest. And Melchizedek affirms the complex metaphysics and cosmology that is common in the Gnostic texts. And it affirms that Christ was a spiritual teacher offering Gnosis, but, but rejects Docetism, insisting that Jesus was human with a human body. So these are all non-Docetist books which take this firm position that the resurrection is only spiritual. Meanwhile, there are also other books that are Docetist, and that, that not only deny that there was a bodily resurrection, but even deny the crucifixion, claim that Jesus Christ didn't have any physical body and hence could not be nailed to a cross. And some of them claim that instead a substitute was crucified instead of Christ. So in short, there are varying views in these books on the nature of Christ, whether he was spiritual or bodily, whether he was crucified or not. But still, the crux of the debate was on the resurrection, and it seems that the Gnostic writers consistently believed that it was not bodily, but purely spiritual. And this is the real dividing line, it seems, between the mainstream doctrine that was preached in churches and the esoteric secret doctrine that the Gnostics shared among themselves. The Gnostics, it seems, also then applied this doctrine of the resurrection to other Christians, to the followers of Christ, and claimed that Christians would have resurrection and eternal life in spirit only. There would not be a physical or bodily resurrection. And this is especially emphasized in the Gospel of Philip, which has a crucial line that says, quote, Those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they do not first receive the resurrection while they live, when they die, they will receive nothing. So they're insisting here that a Christian experiences the resurrection while still alive, because it is a spiritual resurrection. It's a resurrection in the sense of attaining spiritual immortality. It is not the reviving of the body after death. And according to this Gospel of Philip further, it insists that Jesus did not die or resurrect at all, but was already immortal. And the implication then is followers who achieve gnosis, so Christians who have faith and who achieve this spiritual gnosis, will also become immortal like Christ, and they will have this resurrection while alive as well. Okay, a second major theme running through the Nag Hammadi library I mentioned a minute ago is the cosmology, the very complex, multi-layered view of the universe which is based around the doctrine of emanations, the idea that there is a sort of purely spiritual God and that everything else in the universe is a sort of extension or emanation coming out of that God and becoming more and more base and corrupted as it extends outward. So this is a much more complicated doctrine than just simple dualism of light versus dark. And this doctrine of emanations is summarized in the books Zostrianos, Marsanis, and The Thought of Norea, and it again is centered on this idea there is a good god of light and the rest of the cosmos is a series of projections outward of that light taking on different forms as it emanates. And this gives rise to a multi-tiered universe and a profusion of different higher and lower realms, which collectively are called pleroma or fullness. And the nature and origin of the Pleroma is also given greater detail in the Apocryphon of John, or Secret Book of John, which seems to be a highly important book. It appears three times in Co Codex 2, 3, and 4. So it must have been recreated and used widely among Gnostics. And the Apocryphon of John describes the creation of the different realms of the universe, which begins with emanations from God that form sort of heavenly or spiritual realms ruled over by benevolent spirits called eons. One of these eons reportedly called Sophia, which of course in Greek philosophy signifies divine wisdom. This eon Sophia accidentally gives birth to a lower being 
and then this lower being uh, sort of multiplies and spawns and this gives rise to a whole realm of lower demonic beings called archons. So this is important because if we think of Epiphanius, he keeps using this word archon, they give offerings to the archon, but he doesn't seem to have much understanding of what that means. Well, Apocryphon of John makes this clear distinction. There are the higher good beings, eons, and then they spawn the lower ruling forces, the archons. And one particular evil archon called Yalta Boat then creates humankind and the material world. So that's how our world came about. The archons then see the goodness and the light that is in humankind. They see that there is a divine spark, a spiritual element in humankind. And they decide to try to trap that spiritual being in Eden. So the Garden of Eden is understood as a, a false paradise that imprisons the spirit. So Yalta Boat creates human reproduction, the pattern of procreation in order to keep these human spirits entrapped in the material world. He wants to keep them in ignorance of their divine nature. They should not know that they are spiritual beings so that they will be kept trapped in the physical world. What eventually offers to free them, of course, is Christ. Christ counteracts the archons and he preaches the possibility of contact with the true spirit that will free them. So this is the basic mythology, you could say, which seems to be very important in this Apocryphon of John. There also is more elaborate detail given on the lower visible realms of the cosmos in another book called The Hypostasis of the Archons, which also can just mean the true existence or true nature of the archons. And this book is an elaborate commentary on the book of Genesis and the process of creation. And it explains the various realms of the cosmos and the different archon gods and spirits that rule them. So this cosmology can get very elaborate, at least for some Gnostics. And it seems it was drawn at least partly from non-Christian sources. And we can see this clearly because there's another short book called The Epistle of Eunostos the Blessed, which appears twice in Codex 3 and Codex 4, which also expounds on this cosmology. And it has no specific Christian references. It does not mention Jesus Christ. It does not mention any particular biblical figures. But then there is another book called the Sophia of Jesus Christ in Codex 3, which is clearly based on the epistle of Eunostos. It's basically the same thing, but with some expansions and with some Christian stories and elements added in. And it's rearranged into the form of a dialogue, a dialogue of 13 questions between the disciples and Jesus' answers to them. So you can see this as an obvious effort to Christianize this already existing cosmology, and or maybe to merge it, you could say, to synthesize it with Christian mythology. So all in all, the Nag Hammadi Library reveals a very rich, complex view of the cosmos, m much more developed than just dualism and just warring light-dark principles. And it clearly links Gnosticism to other later mystical traditions, like Kabbalah in Judaism, like Neoplatonism in both the ancient world and the Renaissance, that have very similar doctrines of emanations and uh, hierarchically arranged realms of the universe. So it raises the question then whether there are mutual shared sources here, maybe in even older mystical teachings, or if there was some influence and contact from Gnostic Christianity to these other later mystical schools. So another clear theme here throughout the library, which should be clear by this point, is an obsession with Genesis and with understanding creation. There are many tracts that repeatedly try to analyze and reinterpret the book of Genesis and the myths in it and the creation of the world and humanity in order to make sure that they are understood with the correct spiritual and metaphysical meaning. So some common differences between the Gnostic understanding of creation and the Orthodox one Firstly, should be obvious, the material world is seen by the Gnostics as evil, as a trap, 
and also as an unfortunate mistake. The good creation wrought by the higher beings is only spiritual, and the lower realms of the universe are just a, a blunder. So, for instance, in the Gospel of Truth, it said that the lower world was created by the eons by mistake, this book, The Gospel of Truth, also seems to be very important because it's repeated twice in Codex 1 and 12, and it is mentioned by name by Irenaeus. So it's the one book that those early Christian Orthodox writers seem to have been aware of and could speak of by name. Irenaeus claims that it was written by a disciple of Valentinus, so it's in the Valentinian stream or faction of Gnosticism. And it seems to have captured this kind of core important doctrine. In addition, the dialogue of the Savior in Codex 3 describes three apostles, Mary, Thomas, and Matthew, being led around and shown different realms of the universe. At one point, they are shown hell, which is a lot like, you know, the traditional vision of hell that we know today. And they are told that the material world is an evil and unintended creation. So you could think of everything that we encounter in ordinary life as like hell, <laughs> or as one step away from hell, and as a kind of uh, accident or mistake of creation. Humans, of course, are trapped in this evil creation. And Jesus, as I said, is the teacher who saves the spirits of mankind by giving them spiritual truth and hence setting them free. And this understanding of, of Christ in the cosmos can sound very similar to some passages in the canonical New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John obviously is, is rooted very much in the Jewish wisdom tradition. It has, you could say, the closest resonances with Gnosticism. And you might think of passages like, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You know, in, in that sense, some of these basic ideas of Gnosticism might have been fairly widespread in early Christianity and made their way into different communities. So in the Gnostic view of Genesis, more specifically, Eden is a false paradise with earthly temptations, and people must be freed from it. So in this version of Genesis, eating from the tree of knowledge is a good thing, and the Gnostic Gospels show much greater sympathy for Eve and also even for the serpent. There is a great value on learning the truth, which... Eve achieves by following the lead of the serpent. And the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, therefore, is not a punishment from God. Rather, it is an evil action by the archons who want to separate humankind from that special spiritual knowledge. And this basic understanding of creation is seen in the tract On the Origin of the World, which also is repeated in Codex 2 and 13. And this is probably the most radical of the Gnostic commentaries on Genesis. It reinterprets and recasts the whole meaning of Genesis by showing that the, the Genesis God described in the canonical book is not the real God. Rather, it is in fact the malevolent demiurge, Yaldabaoth, and the serpent is a good spirit sent by Sophia, this spirit of divine wisdom, in order to help humans towards enlightenment. So in a way, the, the whole story is turned upside down. And furthermore, in the Testimony of Truth in Codex 9, this tract retells the Garden of Eden story from the viewpoint of the serpent. So the serpent becomes a sort of wisdom teacher like Peter and Paul and Mary and so on. So this might sound somewhat bizarre or shocking, but it, it's actually not as much so as it might seem from our point of view today. Because if one goes back to the book of Genesis, as it was written and understood in the Jewish tradition, it does not explicitly say that the serpent is bad. It's only a much later Christian interpolation to say the serpent is the devil or Satan or Lucifer or some kind of evil malevolent spirit. In in the book of Genesis, it's just it's just a snake. It's just a an, an animal 
a talking animal like any number of others. And there's an ambiguity, right? There's a space of ambiguity in how you understand the serpent, the tree of knowledge, the expulsion from Eden. And the orthodox interpretation diverged from the Gnostic interpretation. They went off in opposite directions. And the Gnostic interpretation may be a very early one. It may be a, a very early way that Christians understood the Genesis story. It's not necessarily a later perversion just to upset people, but they are putting the opposite spin on it from the view that would become orthodoxy. The non Kamadi texts also apparently reject the sanctity of the body and procreation. So as I mentioned, the Apocryphon of John, which is a clearly very centrally important Gnostic text, casts reproduction as a creation of the evil archons designed to keep the spirit imprisoned. And this basic idea shows up in different ways in other tracts as well. Nothing in the Nag Hammadi library supports the idea of Gnostics engaging in orgies or in seeing sex as some sort of holy act or offering. So there is no corroboration here in all these 44 different texts. There's no corroboration for Epiphanius's stories and allegations about group sex or about viewing sex or eating as holy offerings. So this tends towards the idea that Epiphanius was simply distorting and defaming the Gnostics and using sensational stories to do that. And rather, the Gnostics, it seems, put a spiritual interpretation not onto unholy acts like orgies, but rather they put spiritual interpretations onto standard familiar church sacraments and rituals. And so Gnosticism was about the esoteric understanding of ordinary Christian practices. So for example, in the Gospel of Philip, Christ is recounted giving a commentary on the sacraments of baptism, marriage, and anointing, or chrism, as it would be called in Greek. And he casts the sacraments as representing or symbolizing the different levels of initiation into Gnostic wisdom. And the gospel specifically says, quote, the Lord did everything in a mystery, a baptism and a chrism and a Eucharist and a redemption and a bridal chamber. So it's suggesting that there's a sort of process that leads eventually to this bridal chamber, a kind of spiritual marriage or union with Christ. And this process of spiritual development is marked out by the sacraments and it leads towards becoming like Christ. And the Gospel of Philip says at one point, Jesus came to crucify the world. So everyone is going to go through some kind of passion or suffering like Christ. And, quote, those who produce the name of the Holy Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are no longer a Christian, but are Christ, end quote. So this is as explicit as this doctrine gets, that if you achieve Gnosis, you are capable of becoming a Christ. And the spiritual process and the spiritual power of Gnosis is transmitted through the sacraments, right? not through not through the inversion of the sacraments, but through ordinary church sacraments understood in a spiritual way. Beyond this, there is no evidence of any special distinct Gnostic ritual practices other than some prayers and meditations. So for example, the Steles of Seth are a collection of hymns supposedly written by Seth that can be recited as part of spiritual meditation and also the holy book of the great invisible spirit discusses creation and it seems that there are elements in this book that are ritual or incantatory and it it ends with a hymn and this hymn in turn ends with just a long string of vowels with no consonants so what could appear to be just kind of nonsense sounds but probably was a sort of chant, part of a, a meditation with a, a coded spiritual meaning. So this is the only indication in the whole library that there was any sort of special ritual worship practice outside of the sacraments and the worship that ordinary Christians knew in church. <laughs> 
As for where Gnosticism came from in this question of is it a Christian development or does it come from outside influence, the library shows very eclectic sources. It's clearly drawing on a wide range of knowledge, Jewish, Egyptian, and especially Greek. There are obviously many Sethian documents, some of which, like the steles of Seth, are explicitly attributed to the authorship of Seth. And some of these Sethian documents have no explicit references to Jesus Christ. Some of them might refer to an illuminator or a teacher of knowledge, which could arguably be Jesus Christ, or it could be Seth, or it could be both, if they saw Christ as a sort of second coming or reincarnation of Seth. There are several Hermetic texts with no explicit Christian references either, and these, as I said, were developed in philosophical mystery cults in late Roman Egypt that centered on the Egyptian death god Thoth. So again, a sort of association with death, death of the body, spiritual enlightenment, spiritual resurrection, a lot like the Sethians. There are also two Greek philosophical texts, as I mentioned. There's a version of Plato's Republic, which has been heavily revised and has interpolations added in inserting Gnostic Christian ideas. There also is the Sentences of Sextus, which is a collection of utterances and short aphorisms, supposedly from a teacher named Sextus who was part of the Pythagorean school. And they include statements like, the soul is illuminated by the recollection of deity, and a wise intellect is the mirror of God. So there's again this notion of spiritual enlightenment and the idea that enlightenment makes you like God. And these can be drawn out of non-Christian classical sources. They're not necessarily exclusively Christian. There's also an exegesis on the soul, which is very interesting because of what it shows about the inspiration and the sources for Gnostic thought. So the exegesis on the soul is fairly simple. It does not have the elaborate cosmology with the eons and the archons. It's just a short commentary on the fall and redemption of the soul, and it uses the metaphor of a woman, a virgin who becomes a prostitute but then redeems herself. And this exegesis cites authoritative sources. It sort of makes a theological argument, and it cites sources which include several New Testament texts, so they were not unaware of the New Testament canon, and they did draw on it. It also cites Homer's Odyssey as a source text. So it seems that at least some Gnostics could kind of freely mix and match classical Greek and biblical sources. So it seems Gnosticism must have been an outgrowth of a complex, multilingual, cosmopolitan, late Roman world. And that may be sufficient to account for how they came up with the doctrines they did. A connection even further to India is still possible, but there is nothing specific anywhere in the Nag Hammadi library to connect it to India. So that is not proved. And the last really prevalent theme that you probably can discern from what I've talked about is relating to gender. So there is this continuing pattern of greater respect and reverence for female figures, both human and divine, than one sees in Orthodox Christian writings. There is, in the interpretations of Genesis, there's a more positive depiction of Eve and of her decision to partake in knowledge. There is also great respect for Mary and Mary Magdalene. And in the Berlin Codex, one of the four texts in that earlier discovered book is called the Gospel of Mary. And it's not certain what Mary it's referring to, but it seems to be probably Mary Magdalene. And this Gospel of Mary claims that she was closer to Christ and shared more uh, secret and divine wisdom with Christ than did the other apostles like Peter or Paul. There are also, through the Nag Hammadi Library, there are poems and meditations that emphasize the female elements of God in a way that does not appear in orthodox mainstream Christian writings. For instance, the trimorphic protonoia, which I mentioned before, the first thought which takes three forms, 
This is a long speech spoken in the voice of God, but it is highly mystical, and God in this text claims to be the Father, the Invisible Spirit, the Mother, and the Light. So even when there is a male gender attached to God, it's always somehow counterbalanced with a female element. And this raises the question as to whether the Gnostics were largely women. And it certainly seems very possible that these sort of closed, private, secretive groups that gathered and then met separately, apart from the normal church gatherings, may have been largely women, they may have been led by women. And there have been other phenomena like this in history. You might think of Anne Hutchinson's meetings at her house in colonial Boston in the 1600s, when she and other followers, mostly women, would gather in her home and hear her preach and comment on the true meanings of biblical texts. You can see it as a, a sort of repetition of the same phenomenon. And this idea that the Gnostics were largely women and had a different attitude towards gender is borne out by Epiphanius's description, which is unreliable and probably defamatory. But he does describe them as a group of women who tried to seduce him into heresy. And a final doctrinal point that maybe sums up this different view of the divine and of the male and female gender is the great importance placed on Sophia, this female figure of divine wisdom. And the importance of Sophia is probably captured most of all in the poem that I mentioned called Thunder Perfect Mind, or maybe could also be translated as Thunder Complete Mind. Oh, where'd you go? This poem is composed in the voice of Sophia herself, and most of it is in the form of paradoxical statements, possibly trying to convey the essential mystery and ineffability of the divine truth. For example, quote, For I am the first and the last. I am the honored one and the scorned one. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. So it conveys this sort of mystery and paradox of the divine while always keeping up this theme of the female gender and the femininity of this wisdom. And it goes on, For I am knowledge and ignorance. I am shame and boldness. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and peace. And then there are also parts of the poem that suggests that Sophia is a sort of spouse or consort of God, co-eternal with God, very reminiscent of Proverbs 8 in the Hebrew Bible. And so one passage of Thunder says, quote, I am the mother of my father and the sister of my husband, and he is my offspring. I am the staff of his power in his youth, and he is the rod of my old age. So there seems to be a sort of complementarity or an intertwining of these masculine and feminine divine principles. And finally, we can say certainly that this is a Gnostic poem because it claims that Sophia is accessible to anyone and everyone, but also at the same time hidden which seems to be an important belief for the Gnostics, that divine wisdom is not forbidden, it is reachable, but only some will actually access it because it is somehow concealed. And so it says, the poem says, quote, I am the hearing which is attainable to everyone, and the speech which cannot be grasped. I am a mute who does not speak, and great is my multitude of words. Hear me in gentleness, and learn of me in roughness. I am she who cries out, and I am cast forth upon the face of the earth. So Thunder Perfect Mind is probably the greatest example of the Nag Hammadi texts as literature and as art. But along with all the other 43 texts, it has implications for Christian history. What does all of this mean?
for how we view the development of Christianity? Well, there are so many implications, of course, but the main one, which Elaine Pagels really drove home in her book, The Gnostic Gospels, is that they blow apart the idea of a primitive unity of the church or a clear and consistent orthodoxy, which can be traced back to the beginning. So this was the early notion among biblical scholars before the 20th century, was the idea that there was some basic primitive orthodoxy among the disciples of Jesus Christ, which then was perverted and split apart through the centuries. When in fact, if we look back into the first 400 or so years of Christian history, it seems to be basically the opposite. There was variety, there was contradiction, there was confusion and disputation about how to understand Jesus Christ, how to understand the creation, how to understand the resurrection, and that this variety had to be reduced and alternative views suppressed until an orthodoxy was created. So the Nakamadi Library blows apart this myth of a primitive unity or orthodoxy of the church. And the Gnostic understanding of the faith differs dramatically from what we now know as orthodoxy, but at the time, they were both orthodox. They were both widely accepted and fairly highly developed systems of belief that both considered themselves to be authoritative. And it's only because one of those views won out, won the battle against the other, that we now call that one orthodox. And it seems that there was even greater variety of Christian beliefs in these early years than in later ages. And there was a great deal of strength and sophistication among the alternate views. These were not just brief, strange notions that just percolated up in small splinter groups and went away. They were lasting. And in the case of Gnosticism, they were not simply dualist or docetic. They were more unique and distinctive and complex than that. And it raises the question as to whether some elements of these Gnostic teachings actually trace back to the early years of the Christian movement, maybe even to Jesus Christ himself or his disciples. And on that question, the most important text probably in the Nag Hammadi library is the Gospel of Thomas or as it's sometimes called, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas, which is simply a collection of reported utterances of Jesus collected by someone called Didymus Judas Thomas, meaning Judas Thomas the twin. And this most likely is the oldest text in the library. Scholars tend to think it comes from the early second century, so maybe around the same time that the Gospel of John was composed. So we're talking about something early enough that it's contemporary with some of the New Testament writings. And it's simply a collection of things that Jesus supposedly said, and some of them match what he's reported to have said in the canonical Gospels. So you can see repetitions. Some of them are completely different, and those that are different often are cryptic or strange and hard to interpret. Jesus talks about clothing. For instance, he says, you will only be free when you have taken off your clothes and trampled them under your feet. He also says, do not concern yourself day and night with what you will wear. And this sort of theme is very odd and puzzling, but it seems as if according to these utterances in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is suggesting that the body is somehow false or imprisoning or conceals some inner truth. And in this way, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas may be proto-Gnostic. It doesn't have the theology, the cosmology that you see constantly through the other texts. It doesn't have this doctrine about the resurrection being purely spiritual. It's simply a collection of utterances that in some ways suggest the possible rudiments of a Gnostic understanding of Christianity. And so it may be that this was composed and that these utterances are spurious and were made up later by a sort of incipient new mystical group within Christianity. Or it's possible that maybe some of these elements are authentic 
and that they may have come from Jesus himself or from his early followers. And if so, it suggests that maybe there was a secret teaching, as some of the canonical Gospels suggest as well, that there was some secret mystical teaching that Jesus shared only with some disciples and not with others. And if the Gnostic Gospels are to be taken seriously, those were most likely Mary Magdalene and Thomas. But again, this is all very theoretical. There are no surviving documents about Jesus from his own lifetime. So it's only guesswork, and scholars disagree to what degree this Gnostic version of Christianity might have its roots all the way back in the time of Christ himself, or if it only developed later. But what the Nag Hammadi Library definitely does demonstrate is that Gnosticism was strong, it was multivarious, it was not uniform, it was sophisticated, and that it put forward arguments against the more mainstream or what we would call orthodox version of Christianity, and that it flourished for a significant length of time before it was intentionally suppressed. Thank you for listening.